Hello, Anthony. Welcome back to Freedom Philosophy TV for another round of looking at Green Party policy. Um, why, why are we criticizing the Greens? Well, um, that's a good question. Anyone can say, well, guys, you know, aren't they the nice party? Why are you bashing them? The Tories and Labour are worse. The Liberals are turncoats. They um, went in a coalition with the Conservatives and alienated their base. Why are you talking about the Green Party? Well, for me, it's a couple of reasons. I think one of the first reasons is I actually believe that Green Party supporters are fairly outside of the norm in terms of thinking. I think they're probably better critical thinkers than most people who are in the mainstream of pro politics. Obviously, I generalise. And I guess I'd like to get our alternative view of environmentalism, which I think we both feel very strongly about, um, across to people who can actually think outside the box. Mm. For me, the second reason is because um, the Green Party is sort of seen as a real alternative to the system that we have in place. Yeah. And even though in some areas they do provide um, an alternative, I think on the whole, they don't actually present a radical reform to the society we live in. I, I can't see that they seriously significantly want to decrease the size of government in any area or way apart from maybe foreign interventions, which I completely support, maybe a little bit less on law enforcement, yeah. maybe a little bit less on corporate welfare, although they haven't explicitly stated that, so I don't know. Um, it seems for the main part they're only really interested in increasing the size of government. So considering that for years the British public has only had a choice between big government liberals and big government conservatives, another big government party is not really providing any alternative in any radical way. You know, even if you think a lot of these social programs and things like that are beneficial, I have doubts about that on the empirical level. I don't think the data has shown that they are. You could still present a platform that radically reduced the government in terms of foreign interventions, um, bureaucracy, um, corporate welfare, uh, public-private partnership, and all sorts of areas that you know a liberal or left-wing audience could find appealing. And there isn't very much of that on their manifesto, as far as I see it. So it, it's um, basically not a particularly uh, radical uh, change to the system as it is. It's, it's tinkering. Um, and also, as we discussed in a lot last program, we are critical and, and skeptical of the greenness of this party as well. Yes, like, for example, I've not seen them say anything about a, a whole manner of environmental issues. For example, the farming subsidies, which have been such a environmental disaster in this country. In some cases, they've been paying people to leave a if they change a field to make it fallow. So uh, a farmer can take a field that he's growing crops so that he's already that's already fallow grow crops on it, completely destroying the ecosystem, and then the next year make it fallow again after he's already done the damage and cash in from government subsidies. They had all sorts of schemes like that. It takes seven times as much grain to create the same amount of beef. So why isn't beef seven times as expensive as grain? Well, because the vast majority of farming subsidies goes to meat and dairy farmers, forcing people to pay for the mistreatment of animals and, you know, we know that um, a vegetarian diet is better from the environment than one that includes a lot of meat. And that's just one example. We discussed several examples of how they weren't green in our last program that people can catch up on if they haven't seen it yet. Yeah. Yeah. So our criticism really is that they look like a radical departure from uh, um, what you might call uh, centralism. Uh, but in fact, they're not that radical a departure from it. They're only a, 
uh, tinkering at the edges and, and you know, maybe they make some improvements here, maybe they make some things worse in another place, but it's, on the whole, it, it's just not really a big deal in terms of, of overall change. And it's not green. It seems like, <laughs> it seems like they've basically taken various left-wing policies that are already in place and just tried to make them better versions of what they already are. Yeah. And, you know, I don't commit the perfectionist pa fallacy. I do prefer any improvement to society over no improvement at all. Yeah. But I think, actually, in terms of pragmatically, their platform leaves a lot to, desire, to be desired. So maybe we could talk about some major issues that we didn't cover in our last video, which is why we're doing a follow-up. Yeah, okay, so let's go on to the universal basic income. Now, I, I've just run some numbers on this, and I, th I think there's some other numbers around that are similar. Um, but essentially, they want to give everybody uh, a weekly payment uh, of, of a basic income, which I, I think we said was £72 or something like that, um, which is kind of like, I guess, job seekers' allowances now. It's, it's, it's set at the, the sort of poverty line. It's the, the, the level where you've got enough income to pay for your food and, and basic needs. Um, but this, if you figure this out for the whole population, it would be, be something like a, an entire third of the gross domestic product that would be consumed. It's an absolutely colossal sum of money. Um, and to suppose that that won't have some kind of foundational change in the uh, nature of our economy, um, like, for example, changing the tax base um, or, or changing the incentives of people to turn up and go to work, would seem to be, uh, to me, to be incredibly naive and 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 really just uh, completely ignoring uh, economic realities. Uh, what what do you think, Anthony? Well, first of all, as you say, there's the the economic reality that, that it doesn't look fungible at the moment. Then, of course, there's the moral argument which says you're not really actually entitled to anything that anyone has to produce. I mean. They might give it to you if they if they like you or if you if they feel charitable, but you don't have the right to use the gun of the state to get it from someone else. Otherwise, you're actually enslaving them. So I know that not everyone has sympathy with that argument. They think that it's um, rhetorical or something like that, and that you do in fact have the right to. Um, things that other people produce because we live in a state of society. So we should probably look at the practicalities. Before we um, take it down, we should look at some of the benefits of it over the current system. Yeah. Um, as I said, I do not support the perfectionist fallacy where we go, well, that's um, better but it's not good therefore we shouldn't consider it. Mm. In some areas it seems to be better and one of those is that it closes the poverty traps. And Under the current system of welfareism you can earn less if you work more which puts people off taking hours. One thing that this will do is it won't link your basic income to your Employment status, you're entitled to this even if you're employed. So at any stage, if you work more, you'll be earning more, and that would close poverty traps. That makes another sense. Thing, yeah, another thing is that it would give value to work that's not currently remunerated in our society, such as stay-at-home parents or people who do volunteers. Because, of, because it will be much simpler than the current system, it should create less bureaucracy in the welfare system and it will be harder to abuse in the current systems. Maybe there will still be abusers but um, it would be harder to do. Um, it's also meant to, here's that big word that liberals and lefties love to use, reduce inequalities mm -hmm. supposedly and it will also one of the arguments is it's stressful to think that if you lose your job or something like that, then you won't be able to provide for yourself. So it 
provide security for people where they can get that stress off their shoulders. So with all those um, supposed benefits, let's talk about some of the potential costs because those are sociological propositions that it will benefit society in all these ways sociologically. What are the sociological implications of a basic income? And you know what? If it's so good, why can't people fund it voluntarily? Why do people need to be forced at the point of a gun to fund it? Mm. Yeah, I'm always suspicious of an argument that um, proposes that there is only gains uh, by taking a specific action. Every, every action has a cost associated with it. And, and oftentimes with political policies, those costs um, are, don't become obvious for a long time. So, for example, a country might go into a deeply socialist policy and that might work well for 10, 20, 30 years, but then eventually people adjust their behaviours um, and, and the economy ends up collapsing. Um, and the other side of it is that the costs may actually never be seen. So uh, the effects might actually not, they might be like negative effects, so things that you don't, that aren't actually visible. And that, this applies to things like um, guns, typically. It's very difficult to work out. Um, obviously, if somebody gets shot with a gun, there's somebody dead. Um, but it's not so easy to see how many people uh, weren't robbed because the robber knew that they had a gun. So there can be these like hidden effects that, that aren't really measurable or, or not very easy to see. Um, and like uh, I'd like to make an example. Yeah. So people who talk about taxing the rich, you, you can see the, the benefit of the government handing out some money to some people to create a do job or build the Hoover Dam or something like that. Yeah. What you can't see is the long-term growth that the economy messes out on mm. because if that rich person was investing money, they would be the kind of person who wants to get the return on their investment. The best return on their investment is the business that performs the best over the long term. So that stops people starting businesses which create jobs that are sustainable over the long term yes. rather than just a wham bam thank you man for building a Hoover Dam or a highway or whatever social project a project the government wants to fund that might create busy work in the short term Make but will not create long-term growth in the economy and this is a fundamental misunderstanding that socialists and liberals have on growth the Keynesian idea that spending creates growth rather than saving saving creates growth in the long term but as you say it's a fallacy of the seen and the unseen mm. Yeah, that makes me think of the uh, the uh, derelict uh, buildings in in China that the, yeah. um, the the Chinese have created huge loans to these crony, essentially crony corporations, to knock up uh, um, you know acres and acres of of concrete uh, boxes, and there's there's nobody living in them. <laughs> it is just uh, just ghost towns, um, and similar things happened in in. Uh, the Soviet uh, Russia as well, um, like they would build, they would build a factory not based on the efficient use of resources, but on the need for employment in a specific area. So rather than the labour having to move to the plant where it would work efficiently, uh, the plant would be constructed where there was mass unemployment. Um, and this is actually, this is not green. I mean, that's I think. One of the, my main criticisms of socialist and, and welfareist policies is that they are not sustain, sustainable policies and they're not, they're not green. Um, and yet the, the Green Party has these kind of policies at, at its heart. Yes. And... Um, sorry, I've lost you there. Um, it's not green to spend government money on things that people might not need or fake jobs that only exist because the government money is there and aren't actually driven by people's needs. If people want it, they're willing to put out for it. Um, here in Edinburgh, 
we were told that our parliament building would cost £10 million. Pounds. It ended up costing £40 million. Pounds. Oh, sorry, between 10 and 40 million pounds and ended up costing over 400 million pounds. Wow. So, yeah, I'm sure that created jobs and was, you know, up into the economy. Of course not. You know, if you pay someone to dig a hole in the garden and then fill it up again, that is not benefiting the economy. But that's exactly what government and big spending parties seek to do. And they literally did it in Edinburgh because we were meant to spend five hundred million pounds on a tram system for around twenty miles of track. What we ended up paying was a billion pounds for twelve miles of track. Right. If it was in the private sector People would have lost jobs, they would have been held accountable. But, you know, the government gets away with that. Yeah. So inspired. And, you know, where we go? And again, there's an opportunity cost. Um, so we literally did. did yes. And that money could there, have there's an opportunity on. cost in that. Money could have been yeah, spent. The money could have been more productive, more long term, um, and something that that really produced something that people wanted. And and who knows? Yes, and the uh, yes, and a private company offered to buy it up from the government, including the debt. And they didn't. They didn't sell it. They didn't privatize it because oh, we can't guarantee that our people, our cronies in there, will keep their jobs. And oh, we don't want to see advertisements on the sides of the trams. That you know, we can't see advertisement on the sides of the trams to help pay for this mess. So we can't possibly privatize it. It's ridiculous. So to tie this into the universal basic income, what are your views? How does this actually? How does this principle work out when it comes to spending £72 a week to give everyone the basics of what they, they need to survive? Like, how could we be so heartless not to support that? Um, well, for, yeah, first of all, I think, as we've mentioned, there's the moral principle um, that, it, that it's, if it's morally unacceptable for you to take money from a rich person or a person with more, uh, for your own benefit, and it's morally uh, unacceptable for me to do it, then why is it acceptable for somebody with a, a badge and a, a piece of paper to do it? Um, also, like we, we've just been talking about the opportunity cost, um, trillions of pounds are going to go away um, from people who, who made the money um, to people who didn't, um, and I, I guess, you know, that's going to go on fairly ordinary consumer kind of items and food and things that people need, which, you know, is great um, for those people. Um, but then what, what would that money have been spent on and how would it have advanced society um, if it had been kept by the other people? There, there might be some difference there. I don't know. Um, and and it, it, it will be detracting from the uh, productivity of those those businesses that are affected as well, um, and the other thing I I think could be concerning is that yes you you you're creating like a wage floor, um, and so what what happens to the incentive to work around sort of minimum wage levels? Um, what, won't we drive up the prices? of a lot of very basic uh, kind of labor activities. And then of course that will feed back into the cost of living. Um, so what you'll see is the, the cost of living will go up um, and then the government will have to increase taxing to, to, um, to pay for that, to offset that increase. And they'll probably want to print more money. Um, so we're back into this central banking thing and we'll get this inflationary spiral um, and eventually, uh, people will be walking around with wheelbarrows full of money, and you know yeah. the 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 the, uh, the 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 sort of the, the ten pound note will become the trillion pound note, and and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So again, this comes back to not being sustainable, and of course, the Green Party is supposed to be about sustainability. Yes, I think my main concern with the basic income is that. Wealth is generated, money isn't wealth, right? Wealth is generated by people's labor. Mm -hmm. The more money 
you're giving out and the less labor in the economy, the less that money is actually worth. Um, in a sense, the more labor is going on in the co economy, the more people are producing things, creating services, serving other people, the more your money is worth. Yeah. Now, when you give out a lot of money and there's no corresponding increase in economic activity, even though I hate to call it that, I'd rather call it people serving other people, people sure. doing things for each other, whether that's making things or providing a service mm. um, or whatever. You know, the less people are doing stuff that's of service to others, then that money isn't really tied to any labor at all. So that's just basically going to create massive inflation because, um, you know, people can go out and spend their £72, but there's not more stuff to spend it on. So shopkeepers start increasing their prices and whatnot and so forth. So it's really important that the money that people earn is actually corresponding to them either them or someone else producing something. Yeah. And then, so what we really want to do is if we really want to increase people's standards of living, we need to actually get in there and get people involved in learning skills. There's loads of ways to do that. You can do an internet internship or an apprentice. You can work a minimum wage job for three to six months just to learn the skills from that job, then go to another job, learn all the skills, then skip to the next job, and so forth. There's community projects, but more or less, we really need to look at our schools. I'm not one of these people who believes that the only purpose in education is vocational, but 12 to 14 years in mandatory education is long enough to become a concert pianist. Mm. So out of that, surely five hours a week or even less than that on learning skills that have economic value. It's a travesty that anyone can come out of education system and not for 12 to 14 years and not have any skills that fetch 10 pounds an hour. So if the, gov if the Greens are serious about actually improving people's standards of living, it's not about giving people money that's throwing them a fish instead of teaching them how to fish. We really need to look at how our government talks about the importance of people learning skills. And this isn't some kind of randy and selfish, well, if you can't make it for yourself, you don't deserve it. This is about people's basic dignity and a a, a ability to function in the world in a self-actualizing way. Because mm. low-job skills, low-skill low jobs, they ain't that fun. Working in a skilled capacity to serve other people is generally a lot more engaging. Yeah. This is about what we're talking about as a society. And things like the basic income, now it might sound brutal, but it basically disincentivizes people getting on the skills ladder yeah. and um, actually living a fulfilling life yeah I, I you know I find in periods um, where I'm, I'm, I'm not engaged in um, productive employment or productive work um, I find I find that quite a deep you know quite a deep emotional state where I feel uncomfortable I'm like no I, I need to be doing something to to help people and I need to be doing something to get recognition that I've, I've given mm. service to somebody. Um, and, and I think this is, you know, why people who are long-term unemployed get into drink and drugs and depression. Um, we need, um, and I'm saying the we word here, but, but I think it's generally true. We need something productive. We need to give to society. Um, now, um, you know, I'm coming that from that with my perspective. I know, you know, there's sociopaths, there's people with personality problems who have a kind of uh, psyche that, that just likes to take and has, has no desire to give or, or to be uh, useful and productive to other people. Um, so in that way, uh, these, these policies can be quite divisive because they, they appeal to, to a certain minority of people. But overall, I think it's, you know, to me, it's quite important to be productive and to contribute something and to get that money in recognition from people who are real customers who really want this mm. stuff 
um, not, not just a, a handout. Um, and I also wanted to mention um, some interesting things that have gone on in Venezuela, uh, where the, the sort of socialist party there are trying, basically um, trying to reduce prices and keep, keep in place uh, a ceiling of prices on basic commodities. And of course, this is just creating a black market um, where, where people are uh, acquiring uh, these goods um, at the artificially low price from the government and then shipping them over the border to Colombia where they can sell them higher. Um, so any, any kind of government intervention has to be, be uh, very carefully constructed so that it doesn't create these uh, price imbalances um, and cause a movement of, of people and goods. And of course, that's, that's probably what's going to happen when you cut, start inflating uh, the tax um, on the productive classes. Um, and this happened in, um, I think, the Bahamas or, or somewhere in the West Indies. Um, the socialist government came in and um, a lot of, I think it was Asians, said, right, that's it. We're, we're leaving um, wherever it is in the West Indies. We're, we're going now. <laughs> Um, we'll take you know our businesses and, and whatever, and we'll go to another country. We'll go back to to India, um, where our taxes are lower, and we'll set up over there again. So you get this huge sort of brain drain from society, and then of course the, your your tax base goes down, and we're back to we're printing more money. And of course, in East Germany, they they had to put a wall around the, the country to stop people from from moving out into a better life in the uh, somewhat more capitalistic uh, rest of the world. Yes, I think the idea that people have is a view of the society, like the economy is just a chessboard, and you can move the pieces from here to here, Yeah. and that's all that happens. There's no knock-on effect. But actually, when you implement policies, people, are, people respond to incentives, whether you like it or not. And it actually changes the sociology of the country over time. Mm. So if you look at something like the history of welfare, I know it's well quoted by libertarian-minded people, that up to before the welfare state was actually introduced, poverty was rapidly declining in the USA over time. And critics of welfareism said, look, if you pay people not to be productive, you're not going to help the poor over time. It might seem like you're helping them in that moment, but over time you're going to create a permanent underclass. Mm. And that's exactly what's happened. And we're supposed to be the heartless ones for not supporting the welfare state. But how? in what way is it heartless to put ideology before reality? Mm. If you really want to help people, then you look at the facts of what has historically been shown to help people in the long term over time, and you adopt those policies. You don't say, well, I feel so bad for those people who are poor, so I want to force someone else to pay for them because I can't be bothered volunteering at a hopeless homeless shelter and most people can't be bothered doing it either so I want to force someone else to do my dirty work for me because I don't really care about the poor you know you, I don't really want to get my hands dirty at least you yeah. know so if you want to help the poor great go and help the poor you know oh, yeah. I, I went on I care about the environment so I went on tree planting retreats and things like that I recommend this charity to anyone who wants to do some tree planting themselves, it's a really, really worthwhile uh, week away, you know? This, um, this um, what you're talking about segues very nicely into our, our next topic, actually. I'd, I'd like to move on to that now. Uh, one, of my sure. bug, one of my bugbears is the high cost of housing. I mean, it's preposterous um, that to house yourself is sort of 100,000 pounds plus in the north to 200,000. And in the South, it's sort of 200,000 to 300,000. Um, and I've, I've made a program about uh, somebody called Charlie who built his own home out of recycled uh, material and natural, uh, uh, natural um, uh, materials um, for, you know, sort of five to 10,000, maybe 15,000 tops um, on some private land. It was, his, I think, his family's land. Uh, and of course, the council want to knock it down because they consider it to be unsightly. 
um, which is absolutely obscene. It's all obscene to me anyway. Um, and the Greens have kind of nodded to, yes, we'll allow some of these more uh, uh, green and environmentally friendly homes, but they also want to build half a million uh, conventional homes, which is, is a massive use of resources, uh, cement, concrete, all these other things that are, are bad uh, in terms of CO2 production. Um, and uh, they also want to continue to pay housing benefits, which is our, our next topic. Um, and of course, most of these benefits end up in the pockets of, of uh, landlords who have, many of whom have borrowed money from essentially the central bank uh, to become property owners. Um, so it, it's a whole sort of, uh, I don't know whether Ponzi scheme is the right word for it, but it's a, it's, a very nice, um, it's a very nice source of income for a class of people that aren't really being productive at the end of the day. They're just taking a, a bit of a risk. Um, not that I, I'm against risk taking. I think it is a useful activity in a free market. Um, but this is almost like a handout for, for like a middle class of people to own property. And of course, it doesn't, it doesn't get, really get uh, less well-off people onto the property market. It's actually, again, keeping them in this sort of poverty trap. Uh, have you got anything to add to that, Anthony? Yes. Housing benefits seems like a good idea if you, again, see the economy as a chessboard. These yeah. people need help. Let's give them money. In reality, housing benefit is welfare to landlords, mm. the rich people, the ones that socialists and people on the left hate. Why? It's basic supply and demand. If people are willing, uh, are, if you're artificially making people capable of paying more for that service, then landlords are going to charge more money. Mm. As a consequence of that, because landlords can charge more money, the price of housing will go up as well. Yeah. Because you can make more money from buying by buying to rent. I think that on a free market, well, first of all, housing in the 70s cost about a tenth of what it costs now. So that's a really remarkable increase. Hmm. Why did that happen? Well, lots of things. Yeah. When the government inflates the currency all the time, keeping cash in the bank is not reliable. And so, you know, put it in put it in property to retain its value. That, put, that, creates, that drives demand, increasing the cost of housing. Um, artificially lowering the interest rates for so long, that makes it cheaper for people to buy a mortgage. That drives demand into the housing market, increasing the price of housing. So the, the, the reason why housing is so expensive is not a free market phenomenon. Far from it. There has been a lot of intervention in the market by the government, and most of it bad. Mm. I would like housing to be cheap and affordable. That is the real basic income, reducing the costs of goods. And the best way to reduce the costs of goods is a free market, because a free market creates an upward pressure in quality, because firms are competing to make the best product for the lowest price and a downward pressure in price. We need to free up our markets. We need to allow people to buy the land that the government holds on to and build housing themselves. Yeah, or yurts or, or something else that's yes. um, much more affordable. So again, again, this really isn't um, a green or sustainable uh, policy, is it, that the Green Party have with, with the housing benefits? Um, no, and the only thing that it can do is sustain the ridiculous house prices and the ridiculous profiteering of landlords who can afford to simply buy to rent buy, and then buy another one to rent and yeah. so forth. Yeah. There's That's nothing... Fine. And the, There's nothing behind. About, yeah, and the bankers who, who are benefiting from the mortgages, there is nothing egalitarian about this policy. If the Greens are serious, when they say we are committed to providing well-being and prosperity for everyone in harmony with nature, if they're serious about that, we need to look at the ways that the government intervenes in society, driving up the cost of goods, which lowers people's standards of living, driving up the cost of um, 
housing and so forth. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. It's, it's been really good to talk about that. Is there anything else we'd like to talk about in this program? Yeah, let's talk about a couple of things we like about the Green Party. Great. So what, what can you say that you like about the Green Party? Yeah, well, we've got quite progressive policies on crime in the Green Party, haven't we? We've got um, a, a, a tiny bit of drug liberalisation, um, but, but not a lot. Um, and, and I think something that's really appealing to me is the um, idea of, of re retributive uh, um, justice. Justice. Uh, so uh, instead sorry, of restorative justice, restorative justice. Sorry, yes. Instead of re um, retribution, yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, they've got the policy of restorative justice, which means that the person who did wrong uh, does something uh, like pays a penalty or a fine or does some work to make good the damage that they caused to their victim. Um, and this is great because presently the system is, is based around the state being the prosecutor and um, on the whole, uh, large fines and things like that, I think, go into the state coffers uh, and not so much to the victims. Um, and of course, puni punishment um, is, is not an effectual system. So if, if, you have the, if you have the argument based on consequentialism, then uh, punishment is, is a fail, and imprisonment and, and extortionate fines and so on and so forth. They actually have negative outcomes. Yes. Um, our current system does nothing or next to nothing for victims. In certain systems, they have systems where, you know, if someone in your family was murdered and the, the, it can be arranged safely and whatnot, that while that... Um, perpetrator is in prison, they can actually go and speak to the perpetrator and tell them what it's like for them and the perpetrator can speak about their background and they can get some understanding of what actually happened there, you know, in the same way that if you had a tragedy in your life you'd want to spend some time really understanding what actually happened to you you know, if you made mistakes that led to it, what happened there. And something about actually understanding the circumstances is really helpful for people mm. to make peace. Now, that was also part of the rehabilitation of the offender in cases where that offender could be rehabilitated. You know, there might be some psychopaths and things like that that simply can't be rehabilitated. Yeah. Um, but then they are a different demographic from people who've um, probably done some pretty horrible things and come from pretty horrible backgrounds and whatnot that actually, I mean, we know some things that work for rehabilitating criminals. If they're able to study a master's degree while they're in prison, that dramatically lowers the chances of reoffense. Transcendental meditation, learning nonviolent communication while in prison, um, and various other modalities. Now, if we could look at our crime policy and start adopting some of those things, I know some people would be like, oh, you want to be a soft touch in crime, but actually what we want to do is stop spending so much money locking people up for long periods of time when actually if they were given the right conditions, they might actually be able to not only um, become the kind of person who wouldn't reoffend, but get engaged in some sort of meaningful work in the society. And again, the great thing about restorative justice is it actually takes the victims into concern and does something to maybe provide them with some counselling and provide them with recompense for whatever they've lost. And the, the victim is given an opportunity to actually do something constructive to make good because you can't change the past, but you can always look at the present moment and make a re rational assessment of what would be the best way to move forward. So I commend the Green Party on putting forward restorative justice as a solution, and that, that's a really great step in the right direction. Yeah, this raises a question for me, and, and that's how would the Green Party uh, punish people who won't pay their taxes? 
Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, what will their argument be when they say, well, if you don't pay these taxes, then these people will go hungry, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, you know, people say, well, yeah, but I earned this money. It's, it's mine. Uh, how, can, how can you, that, you know, how can you steal it? Doesn't, doesn't that make you criminals? And shouldn't you be uh, paying back the taxes that you've stolen? Because um, the, the whole dynamic of, of, of uh, uh, statism uh, is predicated on certain crimes being lawful when certain individuals commit them. Um, so I, I just, I, I suspect most Greens aren't even aware of this kind of argument that's uh, very common amongst uh, anarchists, particularly I think anarcho-capitalist uh, types and libertarians. Uh, I don't think they've seen that stuff. So yeah, I, I wonder how um, I wonder how it will go uh, if if they ever uh, in the unlikely event got got into power and uh, did all these these policies. I'm also pleased, as you said, that they're looking at decriminalizing um, drugs. Now, despite looking like a, despite looking like some kind of, I don't want to say uh, what, um, I've been accused of looking like, at, I'm not a weed smoker, um, but I do agree with drug decriminalization. In fact, I believe in drug legalization. I think that the Green Party aren't actually going far enough because I think if drugs were legal, I mean, drugs have been illegal for something like 50 years now. Drugs would be so safe by now if you had some of the best pharmacists in the world working for 50 years to make the best product with the least side effects. Drugs would be much safer if they hadn't been made illegal 50 years ago. And what not, that money shouldn't be spent on putting people in jail for activities they engage in voluntarily. If you want to spend government money, then it should be in treating people with addiction problems, not on locking people up. And I think that is where the Green Party are trying to go, like treatment rather than criminalization. I think that it would be a good thing if people could get drugs from legitimate sources rather than some dodgy dealer in an alley because the, they'd know what they were getting. There would be ingredients in the back, such and such a percentage of this, such and such a percentage of that. The product would be a lot safer. We'd see a lot of people, less people going into hospitals and things like that. And I personally don't agree with taxing, but um, a lot of Liberals believe that if you legalize tax, uh, drugs, you can put a tax on them and that can pay for the treatment of criminals. And that's certainly a better system than we, we, we currently have at the moment. Sure. So it, it's, it is a progressive policy and, and one of the better uh, sides of the Green Party. Um, and it's certainly green, uh, as you in the last video. Yeah. Um, I, I know, yeah, for me as, as well, it doesn't go far enough. Um, I'd go further than, um, le than legalization and just say decriminalize. Um, and I think, uh, yes, once um, drug production is, is on the free market again, um, producers will, will produce cheap and, and clean product or pure product, whatever you want to call it. Um, and the sort of the, the mixing down and dirty products that put people a, little, a lot more people in hospital or into morgues unnecessarily uh, would be would be eliminated from the market, as would the violence and gangsterism that goes along with the drug war, um, as would lots of police uh, hours uh, wasted fighting something that can't be beaten. So there's mm -hmm. there's a whole lot more um, and a lot further they could go in that direction. But I suspect they're being uh, either conservative or they don't want to be too radical or whatever it is that people. Um, want to label doing something that is probably the right thing. Um, mm. The other thing that comes up for me around this is is just how silly it is to put uh, drug dealers in prisons. I mean, that's just like the most idiotic thing you could you could possibly do. I mean, they are they are places um, where there is a captive uh, market to sell to, um, where there's a hugely inflated price again because of the the level of status interference is even higher. Um, and and I, I've, I've heard from people that have been in prison uh, for drug dealing and they say, yeah, it's a holiday in there and very profitable. 
Um, and you know, if the go if the government can't control it inside four walls, then it it's just futile to attempt to control it in wider society. Yes, and at the end of the day, you know. Criminalizing drugs is just creating a massive profit for drug dealers. I heard that it costs less to make a kilogram of cocaine than a kilogram of sugar. And yeah, a kilogram of sugar costs one or two pounds. I don't know how much a kilogram of cocaine costs. I've never bought cocaine or taken cocaine, but it might be something like a hundred thousand pounds or certainly several tens of thousand pounds. Yeah. So you are actually creating a massive income for criminals who might be involved in other things that are, you know, worse, you know, um trafficking or or anything. You organize crime, you know Absolutely. You, you so this is a bad idea. Drugs being illegal is a very bad idea on all counts. It's a waste of government money enforcing it. It's creating lots of money for criminal people. It's making the products dangerous and costly, which means that people who are addicted to those products might resort to crime to feed their habits. There's no single criteria in which drug prohibition has been a success or could possibly conceive to be a good thing. So the fact that we still live in a society that hasn't seen the light on this issue um, is beyond me, completely mm. insane. Yeah, I think it comes down to part of, of um, people's psyche and their desire for control and, and fundamentally a, a, uh, a sadistic, a masochistic uh, personality disorder of some kind that's, that's very widespread or deeply ingrained possibly through the schooling system or possibly through uh, a violent and abusive parenting. Um, that's the best I can say on that one. Um, it, it's, yeah, and it's a disturbing thing as well. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the fuel that ignites the state. Hmm. And I'd like to close now. Um, I have this quotation which I'm just going to throw in. Um, and this is from, the, of course, the Green Party, and they say, government is vital, but it's got a bad name, and the expenses scandal was the last straw. Um, is there anything you'd like to, to say about this uh, government being vital, and it's got a bad name? A leopard never changes its spots. There are certain incentives that are inherent in government. As soon as you've got the ability to tax, the ability to regulate, etc, 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 that creates an incentive for people to abuse those things for their gain uh, and diffuse the costs to the entire society. Right. Now you might think that's a good thing because you know poor people can get welfare and things like that so that they don't have to die in the streets. The reality is people with means, people with economic power are going to be incentivized to use the gun of the state and they are better equipped to do so than disadvantaged people. Yeah. If you want to see a lot of the reasons why government can work, I did actually put out a video called Why Government Can Never Work and I maybe deal with about six to eight arguments or in detail on why government itself is a corrupting force in society and the leopard will never change its spots. No matter how hard you try to infiltrate the mafia, you ain't going to be able to turn it into a charity. Mm. That is not their modus operandi. So divest from political action. If you want to change the world, get your hands dirty. Go and get involved. Volunteer. Go and work with people. Learn skills and share them. Teach them to other people. We can do it, but we all need to do it. We can't stop shifting the responsibility to the government. We need to take the reins here, people. Everyone's got unique gifts to offer, and it's just about empowering people to actually share their gifts with the world. That's how we change the world. Yeah, I think some of the most powerful education people can have is about marketing their abilities. It's about getting... Uh, it's about taking the value that they can create in society and sort of optimizing it and then giving them the skills to, to, to sell it to other people or, or to, to share it in, in some way or other. And, and the public school system is not doing this at all. No, and a uh, woe onto the public education system 
it has absolutely been perhaps the, the most damaging sociological factor throughout time. Controversial statement, but you know, you get them in there for 12 to 14 years. You could have te taught them literally anything. You didn't teach them how to maintain high self-esteem. You didn't teach them how to engage in good relationships. You didn't teach them any economic skills. They can't even get a minimum wage job. You just told them to learn a bunch of stuff and repeat it in an exam again. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If we want to change society, we need to really look at the way we educate our children. There is a lot of empirical evidence on the best way people learn. We need to get people in there uh, as, at the policy making level to look at the evidence presented by people like Alfie Cohen and so forth and actually start implementing evidence based education if we actually ever want to see people's potential unlocked. In the meantime, people should focus on their life, learn some useful skills that are uh, useful to other people. If you want, you know, John and I both have YouTube channels on improving relationships. Go and check out our resources. They are free, you know. Make something really special about you, out of your life. Be an inspiration to people around you and then teach them how you did it. That's what we, that's what we need to start doing. It's better than spending all that time whatever reading whatever paper you like, whether it's The Guardian or you know something worse like The Daily Mail. Why not educate yourself on things that can actually benefit your life and the people around you? Mm. Great points to, to close on, Anthony, and um, thank you so much for contributing uh, to this conversation at, Frida, uh, <clears throat> at um, Freedom Philosophy TV again. Thank you for having me on your show a second time. Uh, and, you know, I hope we can continue our partnership in the future. Okay, thank you, Anthony, and bye for now. Bye-bye.